everyone, this is Sam Williams, your host for today. I hope you are well, keeping safe and getting in that unlimited exercise. <laughs> we have got an amazing service lined up for you today. We have got song worship from our very own Joel Coltheart. We have got prayer from Elder Wayne Brockett and we have a phenomenal message from Elder David Lovell. Thank you so much to everybody who prayed for Sarah. We heard last week that she was unable to return to the UK due to lockdown restrictions. Thank God she has returned to the UK this week, safe and sound, and dare I say it, brought the sunshine with her. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well. This is just a quick, quick, quick message um, just to let you know that me and my family arrived home safely yesterday morning. Um, grateful, grateful to God to be home and so grateful to be in my own bed. Oh, yeah, it's just a great feeling. Um, just wanted to say thank you guys for your prayers. Really do appreciate it. I thank you to those who sent me messages and voice notes after they saw my interview. Um, really cheered me up and encouraged me. Uh, I thank you to those who have supported me on this journey. A three week holiday turned into two and a half months of being stranded away from home. Um, so it was difficult, but yeah, it was helpful and supportive to receive messages and phone calls from people encouraging me along the journey. Uh, thank you to those who made contact with airlines, with different authorities to try and get me home. Really appreciate it, man. It's a testimony in itself how we got home, um, which I'll explain at another date because right now I am tired. I just want to rest and chill, but I had to send this message. So yeah, thank you once again, guys, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God is good in every season. There's a reason, yeah, and he's really taught me how to trust him. When I had no control, I had to trust him and he came through. So yeah, thank you once again. And I hope you guys are all keeping safe. Hope you're all doing well. And I hope to see you all sometime soon. Take care. Anyway, enough from me. I'm gonna hand over to Joel Coltheart who's going to lead us in sung worship. Sing a little louder. Oh, 
sing a little louder. Let me hear you sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Father in heaven, we come to you today in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for this day, the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In the midst of these challenging times, I thank you that you are sovereign. You have supreme power and authority. You are seated on your throne and your Lord. The earth is yours, O Lord, and everything in it, the world and all its people, belong to you. You are the author of life, the one who determines our days. And we have confidence in knowing that you are our God, a God that is incomparable, a God like no other. I thank you that you're interested in the affairs of mankind. And even when we fail you, you still love us. And you demonstrated that love for us in that while we were yet sinners, you send your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for our sins. There are many people in our nation and the nations of the world who are crushed because of shattered aspirations. For many, their hopes and dreams are now distant memories. The Bible tells us that you are close to the brokenhearted and rescues those whose spirits are crushed. God, we call upon you on behalf of all those who are hurting and we ask that you bring comfort and peace to their troubled souls. In these unprecedented times of uncertainties, when many have experienced pain and grief, we ask that you sustain them with your grace. Help us all to cast our cares on you, the one who cares for us. We pray wisdom for our government as they lead the nations, that they would heed good and sound advice. Help them to govern and legislate with openness and honesty, and that they will aspire to always do the right thing. We pray for the leaders of our churches, that they will have a voice and their voices will be heard in the place of power. Give them influence amongst the authorities, both at local and international level. And we pray that you will grant them spiritual wisdom and insight so that they grow in their knowledge of God, that their hearts will be flooded with light so that they can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called and give them the right strategies for how to lead their congregation in these difficult times. O oh God, our eyes look to you. Help us to believe that nothing can separate us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey everyone, and you're watching Lockdown with the Givens. My name is Rashad. And my name's Benita. Our lockdown situation um, has been quite good. We're both at home. Um, so we're just kind of learning to work around each other and we've transformed uh, just a space in our home to basically suit work needs more. So it feels like we're at work, but yeah, I think it's been pretty good, what do you think? Yeah, 100% I'll say the same. I think um, it's weird now that the place where we rest has become part of our, our working space now as well. But I think yeah. it's been good just to, you know, be at home, spend more time with each other as well. That's been great. Yeah, I've, I've learned a couple new skills in lockdown so far. I've gotten back into baking a lot. Um, I enjoy that and just like mastering, you know, certain things like vegan cin vegan cinnamon rolls. I mastered that, I'm really happy with that. Um, so it's been fun and just making like my own hair butters and body butters and 
just being a bit DIY. It's been a fun time to do to do that. That's what you call being self-sufficient, man. <laughs> I think, yeah, for me, I've been, in addition to cooking a lot more, I've been using my blender. I've got a Nutribullet. Hold tight, everyone that has a Nutribullet or a blender and um, it's been great to just experiment with different fruits and vegetables um, and just yeah trying to trying to work on health as well which has been an interesting journey. I think the first place that I'm gonna go to once this lockdown has ended is Nando's. <laughs> um, yeah like I know everyone right now is doing these fake away meals and like we've even tried you know like homemade KFC and homemade Nando's and stuff but it's great but it's not the same experience and yeah I miss the carrot cake as well so I'm, I might try to recreate that but it's I don't think you can recreate the Nando's experience I feel like you just have to go um so yeah I'm looking forward to that 100% I think for me it would have to be the barbers um yeah not being able to get a trim since we went into lockdown and that's been tough as you can see the bed has grown now you don't even want to see my hair that's why i'm wearing a hat um so i can't wait to be able to head to the barber shop and get a trim get a shape up yeah man i'm, I'm longing for that so yeah 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 hello everybody it's lovely to meet with you in this new way virtually not virtually, lovely to meet you, but lovely to meet you virtually. Anyway, I'd like to, to share this morning uh, from Philippians 4. Uh, it's verses 4 to 9. Let, let me read this to you. The Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And... The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, be anxious for nothing. But actually what he says is be anxious for nothing but. He's saying we don't need to be anxious, but we need to do something else. Be anxious for nothing but. And today I want to look at what else we need to do instead of being anxious. So firstly I want to draw us to verse 6. Paul says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And I want to pick up on this point that Paul makes, it's in everything. So yes, in the crisis, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, we make our requests known to God. But Paul says, not just in the crisis, but in everything, in every day, in our everyday lifestyle, before the crisis. It's a lifestyle. And he says, we do this by prayer and supplication, still in verse 6. Paul says, we pray and we bring supplication. So prayer is to talk to God, to speak with God. Supplication is to bring our requests to God. So prayer is more than just bringing our requests. Prayer is a dialogue. In fact, it's a lifestyle. The Bible talks about living a life of prayer, praying continually. It's a lifestyle of being intimate in conversation, intimate in relation with God. And that's something Anthony's been talking about over the last few weeks. How as the bride of Christ, we, we have this yearning in our heart to be intimate with God. And Paul's saying we need this type of prayer life, this type of living relationship with God, to be intimate with him. So Matthew 6, Jesus says, pray to God in the secret place. Jesus is saying prayer is intimate, it's personal. Pray in the secret place. In Psalm 91, the Bible tells us that he who dwells, he who lives constantly in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We can know that sense of God shadowing over us if we will live in that secret place of intimacy with God. And such intimacy brings peace 
of God into our lives. It brings the peace of God into our lives. So if you, if you were listening to Trekkers a few weeks back, you would have heard that peace is a peace apart of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you want to see that, I'm going to challenge Jackie now, there'll be a link to that uh, here. Peace is a piece of the fruit of the Spirit. It's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. So Galatians 5, Paul writes, and he says, if we, if we walk by the Spirit, if we walk hand in hand with the Spirit of God, if, if, we, if we daily join with intimate relationship with God, if we abide with Him, abide in His presence, then our character, our behaviour, ourselves, we will change. So Jesus, talking to his disciples, talking to us, in John 15 we read, he says, just like the branch of a vine, when it's joined to the vine, bears fruit like the vine does. So if we are so joined to God, we will bear fruit. And part of this fruit is God's peace in us. So we, we don't, you know, the, the branch doesn't make the fruit, it just sits in the vine and it bears the fruit that comes from the vine. And if we will be intimate with God, live this life with God, then we will bear this fruit. And part of that fruit is the peace of God in our lives. And carrying on in verse 6, Paul says that we do all of this with thanksgiving. We bring our prayers and requests with thanksgiving. He says, while we're in everything, so it's not just in the difficult times, it's not just in the easy times, but in everything, we do it with thanksgiving. What, why would we be thankful to God when we are in difficult times? Firstly, because we trust God's character. We trust that whatever is happening, that God is good and God is doing good. The example that always springs to my mind is the, the three Hebrews, the three Israelites that have been taken captive and taken to Babylon. It was a very troubled and difficult time in the history of Israel. And they've been taken prisoner and taken to Babylon. And the king of Babylon says that they must bow down before his idol. And they won't. They worship God and they won't bow down. And the king says, if you won't bow down to my idol, I will put you in the fiery furnace. Well known account in the scriptures. And they say this, they say, our God, says Daniel 3, says, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us from your fiery furnace. But then in verse 18 they say, but even if not, let it be known, O king, we will not serve your gods. We will not worship your golden idol. You see, they had faith that God could save them, but way above that, they had faith in the character of God. And they were saying, we will trust God and worship God alone, whatever happens. Their faith was in the character of God, and our faith is in the character of God. It doesn't depend on God always doing what we ask. Here's a key point. Faith is resting in God, resting on God, while we are waiting for him. It's a key point to keep, and a key thing to keep in our hearts, that real faith is when we rest in God. We rest on God while we are waiting for him. Psalm 37 verse 7 puts it like this. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And Isaiah 40, 31, it was my father's favourite passage and, and it's well known. It says, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And, and it doesn't mean wait for the Lord. It means to wait on the Lord. Those that rest on the Lord, even in difficult times, they will renew their strength. This is what faith is. You know, Hebrews 11, it talks about people of great faith. It gives us examples of great men of great faith in the Bible. And it talks about people like Daniel, who, who was delivered from the lion's den by his faith in God. We talk, we talk about Moses, who, who brought the people out of Egypt and into Israel. It talks about Joshua, who led the people of Israel into the promised land. It talks about these people as men who did great things with great faith. But in that same list of people with great faith, it talks about people who were tortured but still didn't give up their faith. People who were killed but still didn't give up their faith. Faith is in the character of God, not in what God does. We rest in the Lord. Faith rests in God, rests on God while we wait for him. Now I want to clarify, I'm not, I'm not saying there's no point in praying and there's no point in standing in faith for things. If God puts something in your heart to pray for, if you're praying, then you pray until God tells you to stop praying. You keep praying. That's what the Bible teaches us. We should keep praying. The Bible teaches that. 
But what I'm saying is that while we are praying, never lose the sense that what we are doing is waiting on God, not waiting for God. Don't lose that sense of resting on God in all that we do. So Paul, Paul tells us we should do this with thanksgiving, just carrying on in that theme. Why else would we, even in difficult times, thank God for what he is doing in our lives? Well, because we know that God is working in us through the waiting. Now often we, we're so impatient for God to answer our prayer, but the thing God is really doing, the powerful thing that God is really doing is what he's doing in us through the waiting. So in, in this passage we read in verse 12, Paul speaks of himself as an example. He says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Verse 13, he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So Paul's, Paul's saying, it was only by going through trials and waiting on God, not waiting for God, but waiting on God through my trials that I have learned, I've learned the secret of being content. You know, some of the secrets that we learn, some of the great things, the mysteries of God that we learn, is when we learn to wait on God and let him do things in us while we're going through things. Paul says, I've learned the secret and I've learned that it's God that gives me strength. The strength of Paul's ministry, the, the strength of his faith came because he had learned things when God had taken him through trials while he rested on God. It wasn't just waiting for God impatiently and questioningly. With thanksgiving, why, why else with thanksgiving? Well, it's the same thing really, but James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This is James 1, 2. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, it produces strength and endurance. He says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Because God is doing things in our lives when we rest on him, when we're going through trials. God is doing things in us through the process. But I want to pick up there that James says, let patience have its perfect work in you. I want to tell you, you can waste your trials. You can be so desperate and waiting for God and frustrated rather than resting on God that you waste your trials. That the thing God wanted to work through you and in you through this, that you miss it. Don't waste your trials. This is how we grow. Isaiah 54 too, Isaiah's prophesying and he's talking to a nation that he's telling is going to be taken away to Babylon and that all these things are going to happen. But he's saying that even through this, God is working in you to bring about good things in your life. And in that same period, Jeremiah is saying that God still has good plans for you, even though bad things are happening. But in Isaiah 54 too, Isaiah says in the midst of all of this, he says, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. It's the same thought that James brings when he says, let patience have its perfect work in you. As I was saying, let these things stretch you. Allow God to stretch you in all that's going on in your life. Let them stretch you. Don't fret, rest on God. Put your confidence and faith as resting on God and allow these things to stretch you. Don't spare, he says. Allow it. It will lengthen your cords, it will expand you and it will strengthen your stakes. So we rejoice even in trials because we trust the character of God because we know God is still working in us and we rest on God while we wait, knowing that we can allow these things, we can let these things do good things in our lives. Rather than be troubled by them, we can let God work in us through them while we rest in faith on God. And we move on to verse 7. And Paul says, if we do all of this, if we pray to God and walk intimately with God in this way and rest on him in difficult times, he says, then the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Paul's saying that through such prayer, through, through such an intimate walk with God, we can know the peace of God. We can know God's peace in us. And a key thing I want to tell you here is it's, it's Paul's very clear. It says it's God's peace. It's the peace of God. It's a supernatural peace. 
In John 14, 27, we read, this is Jesus talking to his disciples on the night that he would be betrayed and, and on that weekend where he would be crucified and, and they would be so confused and so worried, so concerned, so troubled. Jesus says to them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. He's saying, I'm going to give you my peace and all these troubles that are coming ahead. I'm preparing you for them and I'm giving you my peace. Not a peace that the world gives, but my peace. See, it's a peace, as Paul says in Philippians, we've just read in this passage. Paul says it's a peace that passes understanding. It passes worldly understanding because it is not of this world. Its source is God. Its supply is God. And it is not... Its source is not based on what happens around us. This is the peace that God places in our hearts and minds and guards us, in us, if we will live intimately with God in this way. It's God's peace. And Paul goes on to say it's this peace that guards our hearts and minds. It governs and guides our lives. I want to say that the reason why this peace guides and governs our lives is because it rules our lives because we submit to this peace. You know, Colossians 3.15, Paul writes and he says, let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. And the word there, let, it, it doesn't just mean allow it, it means submit to it. Submit to the peace of God ruling and reigning in your heart. We let it govern our hearts. We let it become the arbitrator of who we are and what we do. Living in step with the Holy Spirit, as we talked about in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit bearing in us, being productive in us, as we walk intimately with God, this fruit in our life, part of that fruit is the peace of God, and we submit to this. It then becomes the arbiter, that's the Greek word there that Paul uses, it means the, the, the arbiter, the umpire in our lives. We are conscious of this peace. We live intimately with God and each day, in each moment, we're conscious of the peace of God being with us. And when our cho choices disturb this peace of God in our lives, then we submit to the guidance that it brings. That's how it works. That's how it guards our hearts and minds and governs our lives and lives with us. We cooperate with this peace. And it's this peace that guards our hearts and minds. And Paul picks up on this. I, I want to uh, bring bring you back to Jesus on the night when he's saying to his disciples that he leaves his peace with you. In that passage in John 14 through to 17, twice Jesus says to him, let not your hearts be troubled. And, and that does mean allow it. He says, don't allow your hearts to be troubled. He's saying you can allow it and you must not allow it. But let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. So we don't allow our hearts to be troubled we submit to the peace of God. But part of not allowing our hearts to be troubled is that we have to be clear about what it is we think about. Let me draw that out for you. Proverbs 23 says, As a man thinks, so he is. It matters what we think. It all starts in our hearts and minds. The thoughts we feed ourselves, the thoughts that we embrace, the thoughts that we hold on to and mull on, they become what we are. It matters. And Paul picks up on this. If you look at verses 4 to 8, he's saying we must be intentional about what we feed our minds. That's part of this process. So verse 4, so verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul's saying that a part of this knowing the peace of God in our lives and submitting to that is not letting our thoughts trouble us. It's about governing carefully what we think about, thinking about right things. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put this into practice. He's saying, think about other people who are good examples, who live this out. People who give sound teaching, who live godly lives and who bear good fruit, including, including this fruit of the Spirit. Look for these people 
and copy them. And he says, look for me. I'm an example of that. Look to me. I would encourage you today, write down an example of someone who is a good example of this and make a point of noting what they do and copy them. It's always good to look at good examples. If you like, go and talk to them and ask them how they do this. Be intentional about guarding your minds. We have to be intentional about this. You know, the Apostle Peter, he writes to a church that's suffering persecution, and he puts it this way. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's saying, in, in your troubled times, gird up the loins of your mind. They, they would have clearly understood what he meant by that. That was an image they would have understood. Back in those days in the East, people wore flowing robes. But if you were going to run or go into battle or to do something active, this, this robe that you wore that was flowing around you it would have been in the way. And so they had a technique where they would gather it up and tie it around them so that they were free to be active and free to, to do what they needed to do to go into battle, to do work. And, and Peter's saying in the same way, don't be loose in your thinking. Gird up the loins of your mind. Don't allow loose thinking. Think about it and prepare your mind for action and for battle. Don't be loose in your thinking. Gird up the loins of your mind. We, need, we cooperate with this peace. We let the peace of God rule and reign in our lives. We submit to it. But part of that is we let not our hearts be troubled. We we govern our thinking. We, we are thinking carefully about what we think. We feed our minds the right things as part of our cooperation with this peace. And then in verse 7, Paul goes on to say that all of this comes to us through Christ Jesus. He's saying we'll have all of this. Verse 7, it says we'll have the peace of God. In verse 9, he says we'll have the God of peace with us. But in verse 7, Paul makes it clear, all of this comes through Jesus Christ. You know, we can only really know the peace of God when we have peace with God. And, and I want to explain that to you. If, if you're maybe today, you're listening to all of this and, and you're not familiar with these things, you don't know what this means. I, I want to explain what that means. You know, when, when we come to Christmas and we read those wonderful nativity accounts, we read in Matthew that at the, the point that the the angel declares to the shepherds that God has, has brought Jesus to earth. And they have this wonderful phrase where the angels gathering round the heavenly host sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's Matthew 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest. On the earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I've often thought I'd love to have seen that. All of heaven rejoicing at the great thing God has done when Jesus comes into the earth to save us. But the point is, the good news was not peace between men. You know, sometimes I think people read that and I think it was peace on earth. But it wasn't, the good news was not peace between men. The good news was peace and goodwill from God toward men. From God to me. That was the good news. Because it's only through Jesus that we can have peace with God. Other than that, we do not have peace with God. We are enemies of God. The Bible is very clear on this, that God looks at all of us and judges that we are sinners. And you have to understand, we think of sin as something we do against others. But God sees sin first and foremost and fundamentally what we do against him. Sin is against God. And God looks at us and sees that we have sinned against him and the bible is very clear that that alienates us from god it makes us enemies of god paul writes to the colossians 1 colossians 1 19 to 21 i'll just paraphrase it but he's saying that when jesus came it was jesus that reconciles us to god it's jesus that made peace between us and god through the blood of his death on the cross and he says, now, so we who were once alienated from God, we were once enemies of God, have been reconciled to him and can approach him as blameless in his sight. It matters, it's not if I think I'm blameless, it matters whether God says I'm blameless. And Paul says, through Christ's death on the cross, I can approach him blameless, I can approach God blameless in his sight. And the Bible is clear that God has provided all of this himself for us and that God has provided no other way. 
So maybe you're listening today and, and you would like to know this peace of God, but you don't yet have peace with God. So I want to tell you that it's a very simple thing to have, peace with God. We can simply pray and receive it. And uh, it's the A's, helps me remember. This is all you need to pray. You need to acknowledge that God is God and that he is Lord of all, including you. You need to admit to yourself and to God that you are separated from him because of your sin. You have sinned against God. And you, you need to confess to him that this is your fault. You need to be very clear about that. And then you need to accept that Christ died for your sins and that nothing else can reconcile you to God. And having done that, you need to ask God to accept you on this basis alone and to confess to him that you accept him as your Lord and Saviour. And if you'd like to know more about that, please contact us. So that's really all I have, I want to say today. I want to let you know that you can know the peace of God that passes all understanding. And that you can know that we can have the peace of God when we have peace with God. And if you don't know peace with God, please do go through that again. Acknowledge that he is God. Admit that you yourself are separated from him because of your sin. Accept that Christ died for your sins and ask him to accept you on that basis alone. And accept him as your Lord and Saviour. And as I say, please do get in touch if you want to know more about that. So I just want to be, just to conclude really today, you know, these are troubling times, but really life is troubling times. There will always be trouble. And for some people, there all, already were great troubles before ever we came to these times. But Paul says we can be anxious for nothing. He says, let not your heart be troubled. That's what Jesus said to the disciples. And part of that process is to think about what you think about, to tidy up your t thinking, to tighten it up. Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. And, and maybe after this, in, in your groups, if you're meeting, I, I would encourage you, um, maybe just personally for yourself, if you don't want to share it with others, but write down the name of a person who is a good example of that. And then maybe consider why, and maybe talk to them and find out why. But be active in finding out how you can be good at tightening up your thinking. And then... Think to yourself, and maybe this, share in your groups. How can you tighten up your thinking? How can we gird up the loins of our minds so that our thinking isn't loose? So that we don't let our hearts be troubled. We don't let things rob us of the peace of God. We don't let circumstances and things weigh on our minds and steal away from us the peace of God that passes understanding. And then I want to say, you know, we need to very clearly think about the fact that we let the peace of God rule and reign in our hearts. So we have to submit to that. We have to walk in the Spirit daily and be intimate with God. And then this peace of God is part of the fruit that that bears in our lives. You know, think about that. I wonder in your groups whether you could think about how you can cultivate walking intimately with God. That's the first question. Maybe the second one is how you can check that, this, that the fruit of the Spirit is evident, is flourishing in your life, including this fruit, the peace of God which passes all understanding. And we have to rest on God while we wait for him. That's a key point, I think. We have to lose that sense of waiting for God and very much develop the attitude of resting on God. Faith rests on God while we wait for him. Develop that attitude. And, and, uh, and I, would, I would ask us in our groups, maybe to think that through. Is there anything that you have not submitted to the peace of God? Anything. You know, we used to sing that, that old hymn, Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Is there anything that you haven't really submitted to the peace of God? We're worth talking that through and see if you can help each other with that. Maybe in the past, as an example, maybe even now, maybe to encourage and share with each other. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. How can we cultivate the attitude in our heart of resting on God? And then lastly, maybe in your groups, but certainly I want to challenge you, don't waste your trials. Understand that God is working in you through them. God is strengthening you and increasing you through them as you rest on God and in his peace in your lives. 
And, and again, maybe in your groups, you might have examples of how this has happened in the past or how God is working with you through things now. So I'll leave that with you. It'd be good to talk that through. But the peace of God that passes understanding, it rests in us. It lives in us. And I want to encourage you to know that in these times. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our service today. Please stay connected to the life of our church for our social media. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we have our church website. If you're still not connected to a virtual church group, please contact the church office and we will do our best to make sure that you get connected. Okay, let's end our service with the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Well, church, be blessed, stay safe, have a great week, and I will see you soon.